In this video, I continue a discussion of how to translate certain statements into the language of propositional logic. In particular, I'll discuss how certain sentences of if-then or implies structure gets translated into conditionals in the language of propositional logic. In addition, I'll talk some about problems associated with translating statements of the form if-then or statements that have the word implies in it into a condition. In English, we frequently reason and utter sentences of the form if P then Q or P implies Q. How do we translate these types of statements into the language of propositional logic? According to some, the way that these expressions should be translated is in terms of the conditional, also known as the material conditional, that is the formula with the right arrow as the main operator, or, to put this in a different way, a statement of the form if P then Q should be translated into language of propositional logic as P right arrow Q. The rationale behind this is that statements of the form in English if P then Q are true and false in the same, under the same conditions as the conditional in the language of propositional logic. That is, if P then Q is true and false in the same situation under which P right arrow Q is true and false. To see this a little bit more clearly, or to get a sense of how this, why this is the case, it's helpful to look at one type of conditional, known as a conditional promise. This approach is developed by Mark T. Nelson in a very short and easy to read article called Promises and Material Conditionals. If you have a chance, it's worth taking a look at. The basic idea is that we can look at a type of conditional known as a conditional promise. A, f a statement like, if I attend your birthday party, I promise to bring you a present. We can look at these types of sentences where if a condition holds an individual attests that some scenario or event will come about. And think about under which situations is the promise fulfilled, broken, unbroken, and use it as a case to draw a parallel to the truth and falsity of a conditional. So let's take a look at a specific example. Suppose the Almighty makes the following promise to you. If you are kind, then you will go to heaven. Now we can think about under what scenario, under what states has God kept his promise. And so one way to think about this is as follows. We would say that God's utterance is false if his promise is broken. And we would say that God's utterance is true if the promise is unbroken. So suppose you are kind and you do go to heaven. We would say that God's promise here is unbroken. In fact, God fulfills his promise. Given that the promise is unbroken, we would say that God's utterance is true. So the conditional, if you are kind, then you will go to heaven, is true. Well, the same thing is the case for the material conditional in logic. If P is true and Q is true, then the whole complex conditional is true. How about you are kind and you don't go to heaven? Here we would say that God's, God's promise to us is broken. God promised us that we would go to heaven if we were kind. But we were kind and God sent us to straight to hell. And so we would say that God's promise is broken and his utterance here is false. Well, the same thing holds true in symbolic logic. If P is true and Q is false, then we say that the complex conditional is also false. A third case is you are not kind, but you go to heaven anyway. In this scenario, God has not broken a, a promise to us. That is, God said that if we were kind, then we would go to heaven. What he didn't say is what he would do if we weren't kind. And so we would say, given that God hasn't broken a promise to us, his utterance here still remains true. And so the same thing is true in symbolic logic. According to some logicians, if the antecedent of the conditional P is false and the consequent is true, then the whole conditional is true. Lastly, suppose you are not kind and you don't go to heaven. Here again, we would say that God has not broken a promise to us. God said on the condition that we are kind, then we'll go to heaven. And so what God has said here is true. The same thing is, holds true in symbolic logic. If P is false and Q is false, then the whole complex conditional is true.
So here we have a parallel between conditional promises remaining broken and unbroken and the truth and falsity of the complex conditional. So the extension is that all conditionals behave like this. If John is charged with a crime, he will be convicted. We can translate it as J right arrow C. If I am in Toronto, I am in Canada, T right arrow N. If the sun shines today, J Jane will be happy, S right arrow H. So one thing to note is that not all if P then Q statements are conditional promises. So even if we assume that conditional promises, statements of the form, if something happens then I will give you X, can be translated into the form of a conditional in the language of propositional logic. Not all if P then Q statements are conditional promises. Sometimes we utter if P then Q statements, but we're not promising anything. So can these two be translated into the language of a symbolic logic? So there's some skepticism as to whether or not this is the case. So one thing to note is that in the case of the material conditional, that is a formula of the form P right arrow Q, the truth of this conditional depends wholly upon the truth and falsity of the antecedent and consequent and the truth function for the right arrow. The key thing to note about this though is that the truth of this conditional does not depend upon any meaningfully relevant relationship between the antecedent and the consequent. In other words, P and Q need not have anything to do with each other in order for the formula P right arrow Q to be true. So the point to emphasize here is that a conditional P right arrow Q can be true even if there is no relevant relationship between the antecedent P and the consequent Q. This creates a number of counterintuitive results and these results are known as the paradoxes of material implication. So to see these counterintuitive results, it's helpful to look at a couple examples. So first, let's start with the assumption that I do not wake up on time this morning. I wake up extremely late, and let's say I wake up so late, it's 3 p.m. when I needed to wake up at 8 a.m. So given this condition, the following conditionals are true if we assume that they're true and false under the same scenarios as the conditionals in language of propositional logic. If I wake up on time this morning, then loop quantum gravity is a better alternative than string theory. If I wake up on time this morning, then Liverpool FC, a soccer football club, will win the Champions League. And if I wake up on time this morning, then the president will pass some important legislature. Now you might find all of these statements strange. One thing to note about them is that the antecedent, my waking up on time this morning, is not meaningfully related to the consequent. In the first example, the consequent is this situation about loop quantum gravity being a better alternative than string theory. The second one, Liverpool, some football team winning the Champions League. And the third, the president passing some important legislature. And in all these cases, the antecedent and consequent don't seem to have a causal connection to each other or even be relevantly related. Nevertheless, if we treat these statements as being true and false under the same conditions under which a conditional is in the language of propositional logic, then they're all true. That is, each one of these sentences is true in virtue of the fact that the antecedent is false. So since my waking up on time this morning is false, each one of these conditionals or if-then statements is true. So at this point we might find the valuation of the conditional strange or we might put up with it and say well it doesn't really capture the majority of our uses of if p then q or p implies q in daily life. But there are at least two reasons for putting up with this strangeness or to see these two reasons consider that there are 16 different ways that the conditional might be evaluated. Now let's narrow down these 16 different ways. The first two rows are relatively uncontroversial. If P then R or P implies Q is true if both P and R are true and false when P is true and Q is false. What is controversial as we saw or where certain questions we have emerge is when the antecedent P is false and then R is either true or false. Now, one reason for evaluating the fourth row as true is because when the antecedent and the consequent are the same 
proposition or propositional letter, we think that the conditional is true. That is, we think statements like P implies P or R implies R should be true no matter whether P is true or false. That is, statements like if rain is make, made of spaghetti sauce, then rain is made of spaghetti sauce should be true independent of whether or not rain is in fact made of sp spaghetti sauce. We think that P implies P should be true independently of whether P is true or false. So this just really leaves row three. That is statements where P, the antecedent, is false, but Q, the consequent, is true. So with respect to row three, there are two options. First, we could say that P implies Q is true when P is false and Q is true. This is the standard way of evaluating the conditional. Or we could say that when P is false and Q is true, the complex well-formed formula P implies Q should be false. There are several reasons why people want to say that P implies Q is true when P is false and Q is true. Here I'm going to give you two. So the first reason are well-formed formulas of the form P and Q implies P should be true even if P and Q is false. So you can imagine Q being false, and if that were the case, then P and Q would be false. But we still think that P and Q should imply P in virtue of the fact that P implies P. So even if P and Q is false, P and Q nevertheless implies P, and so the conditional P and Q implies P should be true. A second reason for keeping the conditional as true when the antecedent is false and the consequent is true concerns validity. Validity is a property of arguments such that it's impossible for the premises of the argument to be true and the conclusion false. So what happens if we allow conditionals to be true when their antecedents are false? Let's take an argument like P right arrow Q and P and these two are the premises and then a conclusion of Q. So if we say that the conditional P right arrow Q is true when the antecedent P is false and the consequent Q is true, it will never be the case that we come across an invalid argument. That is, it won't ever be the case that it'll be possible for the premises to be true, P right arrow Q and P, and the conclusion Q to be false. So the point here is that if logic is concerned with validity, or truth preservation of arguments, there's nothing lost in allowing the conditional to remain true when the antecedent of the conditional is false. Thus, if we treat if P then Q statements as true when P is false and Q is true, even if we find this result sometimes a little bit counterintuitive, it will never be the case that doing this will yield invalid arguments. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this has been another video on the language of propositional logic. Like the video if you thought it was helpful and subscribe if you're interested in seeing more videos on topics in logic. 